today's video is a quick run through on the basics that you need to know about waves. Fundamentally, waves transfer energy and therefore information using oscillations or disturbances. You can categorize waves into various groups. We have those that pass through a medium, mechanical or pressure waves. Remember that there's no overall or net movement of that medium. Yes, as the wave passes through, you get vibrations through it, but the parts of the medium don't move with the wave along its path. So examples of these are sound waves, seismic waves, the waves that you would have produced on strings. Then we have electromagnetic waves, which are vibrations within electrical and magnetic fields. These do not require a medium to travel through. And examples, of course, are electromagnetic spectrum, light, gamma rays, x-rays, etc. These are definitions that you need to know and need to be able to reproduce. Anytime you are asked, what is a transverse wave? Or, what are the differences between transverse and longitudinal waves? It's just a reproduction of this. This is the definition. A transverse wave is one in which the disturbance is perpendicular to the direction of energy transfer. That same phrase every time. And so if we track one of these dots here, let's watch this one in the center. You can see that this dot is moving up and down perpendicular while the wave moves towards the right. Waves on a string are transverse. All electromagnetic waves are transverse. Some earthquake waves are transverse, the S waves or secondary waves. By contrast, a longitudinal wave is one in which the disturbance is parallel to the direction of energy transfer. So the definitions are very similar. You just need to know that transverse is perpendicular and longitudinal is parallel. And if you watch this red dot in this, you can see the difference between our transverse and longitudinal waves. In this situation, our particles that the wave might be traveling through or our disturbances causing the waves are moving parallel as the wave moves along there. Please resist using the words up and down or over and back because that does not give an idea of the comparison between the motion of the particle or the disturbance that's causing the wave and the direction in which the wave itself is moving. Longitudinal waves are pressure variations, and they cause displacement of molecules. They're made up of compressions and rarefactions. The compressions, of course, are the high-pressure areas, those squashed parts that you see passing along. The rarefactions are the low-pressure areas. They're more stretched out. Waves in general. There are seven things that we need to know. And first of all, wave fronts. The official definition of a wave front is a surface of a wave where the points all have the same phase. If we look at this diagram here, imagine that you are looking down on this wave from the top. The wave front is this line that you see. So it's like the ripple at the top of the wave. When you look down on a ripple tank, the wave front is what you see progressing across the tank. We use wave fronts particularly for diffraction experiments, which we will come to later in another video, because we can track how one wave might interact with another wave as they both travel through the same medium. The second and third things, very familiar from GCSE, I hope, Wavelength is the distance between identical points and successive waves. In other words, from the crest of one wave to the crest of another, from the trough of one wave to the trough of another. And amplitude is the maximum displacement. And that is the height of the wave from zero displacement or from the equilibrium position to its maximum displacement. Be very careful, as you'll know from GCSE, and don't imagine that if that central line wasn't there, that the total height of the wave is the amplitude, it's not. Then we have frequency and period. Frequency is the number of complete cycles or waves that you get in one second. So if you have a frequency of five hertz, you get five waves in one second. I hope you can see that if you have five waves in one second, then each wave should take 0.2 seconds. And this is the connection between frequency and period. The period is the time for one wave, and the frequency is one over the period, or the period is one over the frequency. And finally, the idea of phase difference and path difference. Now this will be new from GCSE. This tells us how in step one wave is in comparison to another. So if waves are perfectly in step, then we say that they have a phase difference of zero. They have the same frequency, the same wavelength, and they form a crest at the same time and a trough at the same time. And of course you can have one wave starting or being slightly out of step 
with another wave. And so we measure how much the difference between waves are using this idea of phase difference. I've put this in with path difference because often it's easier to think about differences in waves in terms of wavelengths. So if one wave starts half a wavelength behind the other, then it has a path difference of half lambda. If it starts one whole wave behind the other, it has a path difference of one lambda and so on. You can have fractions, you can have whole numbers. And we translate that into degrees. So one whole wave is the equivalent of 360 degrees. So you could have a wave that is one whole wave out of step with another, and that means it is 360 degrees out of phase. So we translate path differences in wavelengths into phase differences either in degrees or in radians. And radians are expressed in multiples of pi. So a whole circle, 360 degrees, is 2 pi radians. And that's one whole wavelength. Half a circle, half a wavelength, 180 degrees, pi radians, and so on. As an example, we have our black wave, and it starts at that point there. The gray wave is drawn with a greater amplitude, just so you can distinguish the two. But you can see it starts after the black wave has completed one whole wavelength. So that means it is one whole wavelength path difference. And one wavelength of path difference corresponds to 360 degrees phase difference, or expressed in radians, 2 pi radians. So the gray wave is 2 pi radians behind the black wave, or 360 degrees behind, or 1 lambda path difference. Here we have our gray wave, which is half a wavelength behind, or 180 degrees, or pi radians. Here it's a quarter of a wavelength behind, and you can probably predict what's coming. That is 90 degrees, or pi over 2 radians, and so on. If you want to convert between path difference and phase difference, you take your path difference in lambda, and you multiply it by 2 pi to get your phase difference in radians. And here's a table that shows you the conversion factors between the two. If you do maths, you'll know that 2 pi radians is 360 degrees. You don't have to be a mathematician to know that. It is just a simple fact. It comes from the geometry of circles, but again, you can just use it without having to go into that detail. So here are seven things that we need to be able to know, and these are the vocabulary terms that you're expected to be able to use with confidence when talking about waves. The last thing we're going to be discussing today is the wave equation. Again, this is probably familiar to you from GCSE. However, you would have called it V equals F lambda at that point. Here we use C as in the speed of light because most of the work that we're going to do in future is going to be using electromagnetic waves. And so we just replace the V with C. If you wanted to measure the wavelength, frequency, or speed of waves across a ripple tank like this, there are various different methods of doing it. But for the wavelength, you must remember that you measure the distance across several wave fronts and then divide by the whole number of waves between there. This means that you reduce your percentage uncertainty in your value, so it's likely to be more accurate. To measure the frequency, you can connect your oscillating paddle here to an oscilloscope, a cathode ray oscilloscope, and use the time base on the oscilloscope to calculate the frequency of the wave. Or you can use a strobe light. So if you turn this lamp into a strobe lamp, you can adjust the frequency of the strobe. And when the frequency of the strobe matches the frequency of the waves, they'll appear to stand still. To measure the speed of the waves, you would time how long it takes one wave to travel across the tank. Measure the distance, of course, between the point where the wave is being produced and the end of the tank, and use speed is equal to distance over time. And do that a few times so you can get an average.